Good morning, it's somewhere, and welcome back to the Constellation 2020 Green Room. If you're feeling an episode of hysteria, don't freak out, because with us is possibly the most animated man of the 90s, Tom Ruger. Hey, Tom, welcome aboard. Good to be here. So um, let's talk a little bit about your vast catalog of work as a lyricist. Oh, as a lyricist. Well, there you go. Uh, my first uh, song was in fifth grade. Uh, it, was called, <laughs> it was called Friends Are Friends. Yes, they're deep, profound lyrics. And uh, I got a B minus. So I thought this is my career. Uh, and later on, I, uh, when I worked at Hanna-Barbera, John Luden and I worked on uh, some shows like Pound Puppies and uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Huckleberry, where we inserted some songs into the shows. And uh, back then at Hanna-Barbera, Joe Barbera and Bill Hanna put their names on every one of the songs. So we, did, we didn't get credit for those. Odd, strange, but there were uh, bizarre rules back in those days. When I went to Warner Brothers, though, uh, they didn't have, uh, you know, Bill, Bill and Joe as executive producers hovering above. So uh, when we wrote songs, uh, we actually did get the credit. So uh, Wayne Katz and I wrote the lyrics for a Tiny Toon Adventures uh, theme song. And uh, so that was the, the first... Uh, animated uh, song that I actually got credit for. I had, I had also written the lyrics for uh, a pup named Scooby-Doo back at Hanna-Barbera, but again, you know, Bill and Joe. So uh, Tiny Toons, and then of course, uh, Animaniacs theme songs. So, uh, and there I'm working with uh, Richard Stone. And, uh, and then I also wrote the little jingles for a lot of the uh, little sub-main titles on, uh, Animaniac, so like the little slappy squirrel, you know. She's the crankiest creature in the whole wide world. <laughs> the next cartoon features Slappy the squirrel. Ah, put a sock in it. That's Slappy. So yeah, I love doing those. Uh, and the Pinky and the Brain theme song, which was the little, you know, the Pinky and the Brain, uh, which of course uh, I expanded for the the main title for the, uh, you know, for the series. Uh, Hysteria, I had. I, that for the Hysteria, I wrote lots of different theme songs. We actually had two main theme songs. Uh, Freakazoid, of course, Super Teen Extraordinaire, Freakazoid, Freakazoid. Uh, won the Emmy for that one, won the Emmy for the Animaniacs theme song and the uh, Tiny Toons theme song. Um, so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed, and, and in each theme song, I like to sort of uh, go over the cast list uh, as best I could. Uh, with the time constraints. So, you know, the, maybe the weirdest lyric in all of them is the Animaniacs where it says, uh, uh, good feathers flock together and Slappy wax them with her purse because uh, Slappy and the good feathers, from what I recall, they never met except in the main title. Yep. Uh, and then, yeah, but Hysteria had a lot of little sub-main titles like uh, uh, for, for Toast and for Pepper Mills. And in those, I, I would parody like uh, the Gidget theme song from the 1960s and, and other little theme songs. We, had, we did a parody of the Roadrunner theme song, which the Roadrunner, Roadrunner runs down the road all day. We did that with uh, uh, for... Um, Big Fat Baby. Anyway, lots of different little theme songs. Yeah. So, so you mentioned winning an Emmy. I understand there's like 14 of those. Yeah. Let's see. I'll grab one real quick. Excuse me. Don't mean to go away here. Yeah. So, uh, you just vanished into the forest. It's fine. Oh, here I am. <laughs> so, so Virtual have, background. Uh, if I could change the background, I would, but I, I forgot how to do it. So anyway, uh, right behind me, if you could see them, are... Uh, we have the 14th. My, my lovely bride, my wife, uh, she's a marathon runner, so she has, she has draped all of the uh, Emmys with uh, marathon medals. So yeah, so I have 14 of those. I have, uh, I have something called uh, a Peabody Award. We, have, we won the Peabody for the Animaniacs and uh, other 
little, you know, awards. So the work you've done has been as a producer and an executive producer as the official titles? Uh, let's see. Official title on, uh, since I was sort of the, the, the showrunner on Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, Pink and Brain, and different shows, uh, we would, I was started as a producer on Tiny Toons, and I was the only producer, but then other people uh, uh, deservedly received producer credit, so I became like the, the producer above them, the senior producer. Back then uh, on uh, Tiny Toons and Animaniacs, Stephen was the one and only executive producer. And uh, so, yeah, so I was like head writer, a story editor, senior producer, that sort of thing. Chief cook and bottle washer. Yeah, yeah, so I kind of lived it. The, the interesting thing for me is that uh, we had a, a lot of different people. We had writers, we had directors, we had animators, we had storyboard artists, uh, people mixing it, people editing it. And I was the fortunate one that had the chance to like go through the entire process and be involved with it from like the initial story idea to the finished work print. So, uh, you know, it was quite a quite an adventure for each of these series because all of them, you know, they hit around a hundred episodes. So there were a lot of a lot of episodes of those stories uh, of those series. So, yeah, I've I've been through a lot of different stories with all those different characters. Which, which is really fascinating because I'm sure a lot of people when they hear a producer assume that you're sitting in a room going, can we get a little money to do this? Can we get a little money to do that? And I, I don't think they realize the scope of involvement, especially in your case. Well, uh, and the fortunate thing is since I'm not uh, technically a, a, a businessman or I wouldn't want to have me be the businessman, uh, I was definitely uh, the creative guy. I had started at, at Hanna-Barbera as an animator. Um, I had drawn my whole life, so when I came to California, I uh, went to Hanna-Barbera, and uh, Bill Hanna gave me my first job. I went in there with my portfolio, which was on slides, because I had left my portfolio at Backsheets, so mm -hmm. I didn't have my, so he, he held the slides up to the window uh, to see the light, and he would say, what, what is that? And I'd say, well, that, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a, dog and he says not in my world it's not a dog in my world so uh, he was sort of sort of critical and mm -hmm. he said i'll tell you what i'll give you uh i'll give you a month trial period and uh, you start tomorrow and at that point uh this was back uh, in the very very late 70s uh he had uh joe barbera had sold like 20 25 shows to the different networks and they they needed basically anybody that could hold a pencil to come work at Hanna-Barbera at that point. So I got my trial period. And uh, so I, I spent two, two years uh, as an assistant animator, then an animator. And then I uh, wrote a spec script, sent it around. It was uh, picked up by Filmation. They, they hired me to start writing scripts. And then uh, I shifted back to Hanna-Barbera when they had another season of many series and I became a story editor. And from the story editor position, uh, you know, I got associate producer credit and then uh, I, I started becoming the story editor on uh, Scooby for about four or five years. And that's when I ultimately got the chance to like develop the, the new uh, A Pup Named Scooby-Doo series. And then I became the producer on that. And I'd storyboard and work on the, the artwork with uh, the different crew members. Scott Gerald's, uh, uh, Alfred Gimeno and I spent a day standing behind uh, Iwo Takamoto, who was the great Scooby-Doo designer. And we were redesigning Scooby uh, for a putt named Scooby-Doo. And so there we were, we were standing, there was, there was uh, Iwo, at his drawing board going, mm -hmm. now what you want to do is this, now what you want to do is that. And he'd be drawing over these drawings we've done of a pup named Scooby-Doo, which is a younger Scooby. And for eight hours, we stood there with him saying, see, it needs to be more like this, it needs to be more like that, it needs to be more like that. And uh, we ultimately got his okay for our design for uh, a pup named Scooby-Doo. But he was very, you know, appropriately, uh, 
territorial about his designs. Um, so I, I uh, ultimately, after a putt named Scooby-Doo was successful, Gene McCurdy, my boss at Warner Brother, at, at Hanna Barbera, had gone to Warner Brothers, and they decided they wanted to get into series work and uh, with uh, a show called Tiny Tunes. And so she showed uh, a putt named Scooby-Doo to Steven Spielberg, who was involved, and he said, yeah, bring him over. And that's how I landed over at Warner Brothers. Yeah, I'm just thinking the art style differences. It was like, okay, so Hanna-Barbera, Filmation, Tiny Tunes, and then you dropped in the name Ralph Bashi. Uh, <laughs> that, that's quite a bit of range. I mean, your, your art style is that broad? Well, my art style is, is pretty limited. Uh, I grew up drawing Fred Flintstone and uh, Yogi and Huck, so that was my uh, comfort zone. I mean, even Bugs Bunny was uh, a little tricky for my drawing style. Um, but I started hanging around really talented artists. Uh, the, anime, the Tiny Toons crew, I mean, these were brilliant, brilliant artists, so uh, some of it rubbed off. Um, and, uh, and, but I, but I'd say, you know, the Bakshi stuff, I never did work with Bakshi. I had my portfolio over there, but never worked with him. Uh, Scooby, um, a putt named Scooby-Doo, uh, had a lot of, uh, the Tex Avery influence in it because Pup did big wild takes, eyeballs popping out. So I really loved the, the zanier side of the cartoons. Um, and some of that snuck its way into Tiny Toons. Um, you know, Tiny Toons, uh, the artwork was very much dictated by the classic uh, Warner Brothers cartoons. We were trying to emulate those shorts as best we could uh, with the budget that we had. And we had a great budget and we had beautiful, wonderful Carl Stalling style music. Uh, um, Bruce Broughton was our music uh, director at that point on Tiny Toons. And then Richard Stone, of course, became the music guy on Animaniacs. Um, so I think the style on Animaniacs, we had lots of different little styles. I mean, we had Mr. Skullhead. It was the simplest type of drawing that you could ever have. And uh, the backgrounds uh, could, for Mr. Skullhead could be a little bit like this background, which is actually a, a Yogi Bear background from the late 50s. Um, but uh, really, we captured sort of the classic style with Yakko, Wacko, and Dot. We were really trying to get that beautiful, rich, uh, fully animated look as best we could. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, I, I have friends that we just quote lines from Animaniacs back and forth at each other periodically. Right. Uh, yes. You know, anytime, <laughs> yes, anytime <laughs> the boss leaves, it's we're in charge. We're in charge. <laughs> I don't want to hear another peep out of you. Peep, 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 peep. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, so the, it, it really is fascinating because a lot of the stuff that you did shaped a lot of people's childhoods and a lot of it still has impact today. And it, it, it's got to be very exciting to be involved with something that's got that kind of legs that kind of lasts that way. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely um, hit the zeitgeist pretty well at that point. Um, we didn't know it really. Uh, I knew my kids loved it and I knew their friends loved it. So maybe I should have taken that hint, but uh, we had just wonderful, brilliant, zany people uh, animating it, directing it, writing it. Uh, Sherry Stoner, Paul Rugg, John McCann, Deanna Oliver, uh, Nick Hollander, uh, Peter Hastings. Some of these writers were just nuts. I mean, and I don't mean like clinically insane, but just <laughs> very, very funny people. Uh, and Paul Rugg would say, you know, I knew we were uh, doing well when Ruger was in the booth just laughing his brains out. And it's true. I mean, the actors would be out there delivering these lines that uh, our writers have written. And they really, really made me laugh. Uh, so part of my job, literally was to be sort of the arbiter of what's funny, which is what, what, can you get a better job than that? To be the guy that says, yeah, that's funny. And no, I'm not laughing much at that, but that's funny. So uh, honestly, at, at, at story meetings and in the booth uh, for the recordings, uh, there was a lot of laughter. 
Um, so, uh, and I can't imagine uh, having a better gig for about a dozen years. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the voice talent you've worked with? Because there's some amazing people on that list. Absolutely. Uh, uh, back at Hanna-Barbera days, I worked closely with uh, Dawes Butler, who was uh, the voice of Huck and Yogi and Quick Draw. And, uh, he would do something called Yogi's Treasure Hunt, which Luden and I were uh, story editing. And after the, the each episode, he would come in and say, now, Quick Draw would say it more like this, you know, I'll do the thinning around here and don't you forget it. And, and he would do, you know, Snooper and blah, blah. Now, evidentially, uh, key Snooper, the greatest. And so he, he would give us little subtle twists, you know, Huck would say it more like this, Yogi would say it more like that, which was awesome. And then a guy named Paul Winchell, who did Dastardly, he would come in and give us tips on how to uh, perfectly capture uh, the subtleties of that particular character's voice. So we were very fortunate to have those guys still around doing the, the great stuff they do. Of course, uh, Don Messick, I worked with him for a dozen years on, on Scooby and then as Hampton on Tiny Toons. Uh, on on um, Tiny Tunes, of course, that's where I met Tress McNeil, Charlie Adler, uh, Rob Paulson, Maurice LaMarche, uh, Candy Milo, uh, Cree Summer. I mean, just incredibly versatile, wonderful comic actors. I mean, Tress, you can almost not even hand her a script, just let her start ad-libbing. <laughs> she, she, would, she would probably write better stuff than we have. Um, uh, so just fabulous people. We had uh, Andrea Romano doing the voice directing and our directors would be in there and I'd be in there and you know, it was it was a fairly uh, intense and yet uh, participatory process where you know people definitely uh, were able to like seek the funniest line. Um, I think where I where I really sort of found my my most comfortable zone was when uh, after Tiny Toons, Spielberg, Mr. Spielberg came and said, so what's next? And I said, well, uh, I don't know, we're just wrapping up these episodes. And I mean, like, what, what's our next show? Because we're a big hit, we have to do another show. So I said, oh, well, uh, I've got some ideas. And he said, yeah, well, let's, let's do, uh, he thought, let's do a Plucky Duck series. And I said, oh, gosh, you know, we're, we've just done about a hundred Tiny Toons. I, I know we want to do a, a whole series of Plucky Duck. Said, well, we need a marquee name, you know? We can't just go out. Well, I said, you're the marquee name, Stephen. I mean, Stephen Spielberg presents. He said, no, no, no. I mean, you know, we need a, a name that people know in, in, the, in the series title or, in, uh, you know, for, for the show, we need, you know, somebody that's, that means something besides my name. And so I was stuck because the ideas I had for a new show were all new characters. Um, so I was going across the lot uh, a few days later and I saw the uh, water tower uh, on the lot and I realized, wait, wait, there's the marquee name because on the water tower on the Warner's lot is the WB logo, the emblem. And the characters I had were these nutty characters and I realized, oh, I can put them in the water tower and that can be where they live and that, but that emblem. So I realized we can name the characters, the Warner brothers, have them live in there. And then I can go back to Steven and I did. And I said, so there's your marquee name, the Warner brothers. And there's the, there's their marquee. And he laughed and he thought, wow, you really went around the block to figure that one out. <laughs> and he said, uh, and he bought it. So, uh, so, that's sort of where uh, the Warner Brothers and the Water Tower uh, came from. Um, and we had, uh, of course, Pink the Brain and Slappy Squirrel. Uh, the beauty of that show was that it was all new stuff. We were free to pursue just about any story we liked with these characters. Steven was very busy with uh, Schindler's List and other movies, so he was not uh, terribly involved. So we, as writers and directors and artists, we really had kind of free reign. The, the, we had the keys to the asylum 
for at least a, a couple of years there. And so that was uh, creatively, I think that was the most exciting time because we had really brilliant people involved on every level. The music was at a higher level, uh, the writing, the art, just awesome. And uh, so I think creatively that was my, uh, maybe at my happiest time. I also loved the whole hysteria experience that followed Pinky the Brain. And, and for ultimate crazy zaniness, I think the experience I had on uh, Freakazoid was awesome because, uh, because that was that show was just completely nuts and uh doing a crazy superhero was was a lot of fun so i i do want to ask you about hysteria because it's kind of your hidden gem i think it's the one that most people don't know and really should well uh that came about because uh there was a there was a movement i think peggy Chern was the head of this group that had sold to Congress the concept that uh, every, every channel, every TV station around the country would have to do educational children's programming, uh, programmed a certain number of times per week. So I went to the bosses at, at Warner Brothers and I said, let's make our own educational show, and, but make it funny and entertaining. And uh, they bought that concept. And uh, so that was hysteria, it was based on, uh, well, it was a big cast of kind of funny characters who would travel through time and uh, pop in on great historical moments. Uh, and each show would have a theme, whether it would be, you know, the great inventors or World War II or f the history of France. And so we'd meet Napoleon, we'd meet uh, Philo Farnsworth, who so created television. Uh, we'd meet Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Lincoln. We had and our great voice cast, we had all these wonderful actors like Maurice LaMarche and, and uh, Rob Paulson and Billy West and Tress McNeil, and they would do uh, impressions of, of, you know, of Roosevelt. Uh, Lincoln, I think we had Lincoln, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a Johnny Carson impression. Uh, George Washington was Bob Hope impression. Uh, and so everybody was, Everybody was funny. I mean, Napoleon was like an impression of Hervé Villachev. Uh, so yeah, we we went for the jokes when, wherever we could, and uh, and in the process, we also did tell our audience uh, some historical facts. Uh, we we play with the facts a little bit, but um, yeah, my my younger daughter credits you with her passing history, by the way. What she does? Oh well, then we did our job. But, but she still wants to know, did Froggy ever get to ride the choo-choo? Did Froggy ever what? Get to ride the choo-choo in the Underground Railroad episode. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> very good, very good, very intelligent. Yeah, yeah, see, we, we, we got through some of the kids. Yeah, Froggy, that was my son, by the way, doing the voice of Froggy. Now, Froggy was a character uh, from the Little Rascals you know, back in the 40s. And uh, he saw one of those one day and he turned to me and he did the kids. Froggy was in the, in, in the Little Rascals and, and Nathan's character was Frog Goes. You know, There's a little uh, licensing issue. So, uh, but he could, I can't do it. He could really put it way back in his voice. It's this crazy froggy voice. He also does a pretty good Yoda, but anyway. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, and my other kids, uh, Luke, uh, see, this was, the, this was the magic part of my kids having, uh, you know, their dad making cartoons. Uh, Luke did uh, the voice of the flame in, in Animaniacs, where he was, uh, he, I read the Declaration of Independence over uh, Thomas Jefferson's shoulder. Um, Cody did a voice back there called uh, The Little Bluebird, and he ultimately became Loud Kiddington in Hysteria, which was a kid who was a kid that just screamed at everything. And we asked the, the people watching the TV to turn up your TV set to the maximum level. And, <laughs> and Loud Kiddington would come in and go, <laughs> boom! And uh, probably upset some parents around the country. Yeah. No, it's really neat that you got to involve your family that way. It, 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 it's nice when these things get to become a bonding thing. 
Yeah. Um, Nathan, Luke, and Cody uh, were uh, my inspiration for Yakko, Wacko, and Dot early on because they would do things that would really uh, be annoying. <laughs> and so I used those elements uh, on some of the uh, Animaniac moments, some of the Yakko, Wacko, and Dot moments. Like, uh, I'm Mad, which is the one where they're in the car, it was sort yep. of based on uh, the three of them annoying the heck out of each other. I, I raised my kids with the phrase that the plural of cute is obnoxious. It's only cute once. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Where's it, where it welcome out quickly? Yeah. No, that's really, really cool stuff. You'd mentioned Spielberg being less involved later on. I'm guessing it means he was more involved earlier on. Do you want to talk about what it was like having Steven Spielberg as your boss? Yes. Uh, the first, uh, the first meeting I ever had with him, uh, about an hour beforehand, I had quit Hanna-Barbera, so I had no longer had a job. And, well, Gene McCurdy said, you're going to do this uh, at Warner Brothers. And, uh, but I had, I had to sort of get through the first meeting with Steven. So about an hour before the meeting, I had this, like, panic attack. Oh, my God, what have I done? He might hate my guts. I, I, I quit my job. Oh, my gosh. And my wife told me, just tell, tell him about your favorite cartoon which for some reason calmed me down because I can talk at length about my favorite cartoons, about the Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Porky Pig cartoons that uh, I loved when I was a kid and I grew up with. I mean, I love the Hanna-Barbera stuff too, but we're doing, now we're doing Looney Tunes sort of uh, variation. So. so I did, I went in there and I talked about what made me smile and made me happy watching those cartoons when the Daffy Duck and Porky Pig logo Porky's logo would pop up on the, on the rings, but Daffy, Daffy would be photobombing from behind him and, uh, and how the music would swell and just the zaniness of Daffy and the, the wise ass of uh, Bugs. And basically I, I told him about my favorite cartoons and, and we had this spirited conversation. Oh, remember that, remember that. And so we had this bonding experience right there at the top, which, if, if that's a, a tip to anyone out there, uh, that's sort of how you sell something, I believe, is, is to, if you're trying to sell to a certain person, somehow, if you can connect with that person and get on the same uh, plane and talk about the same stuff and, and uh, relate to each other, I think that's really important. Um, so Stephen, uh, he was gung-ho on Tiny Tunes. He did get very specific about what he wanted. Uh, and I remember, uh, and it was a very challenging. I mean, there was so much work to be done. I mean, every story, uh, every storyboard was something you'd go over. I remember I was on uh, a weekend vacation with my kids and my wife, and we were at this hotel in Laguna Beach. and. You know, nobody knew I was there. I mean, we just took off. And it's 7 a.m. in the morning. And the phone, our phone rings. On, in the, you know, we don't have cell phones back then. So the phone rings in the room. And it's, uh, it's Steven Spielberg on the phone in the hotel. I mean, at the hotel. Uh, he's calling from uh, Long Island. And I'm like, I'm just going to get my phone number. How could this be? I mean, no one. So he proceeds to start giving me, and I don't have the material in front of me, the uh, storyboard. He's, he says, Tom, yeah, I need to go over the storyboard. I just got to have some thoughts. I need to go over them. And for the next hour, he gives me detailed notes, panel by panel of a storyboard that I don't have in front of me. And I'm, I'm, I've seen the storyboard, so I'm trying to imagine, okay, the next page is going to be the scene where they, they run into the bushes. Okay, so he's giving me the notes, and I have a pencil and a Ralph shopping bag that I'm writing the notes on, and then I'm flipping the bag over, and so the bag is just insane. Um, so he was very intense. He, he would uh, get very much involved in, uh, in all aspects. He, he, uh, when we started getting footage back uh, from, uh, we'd, we'd go to uh, TMS, and we went to uh, different studios overseas, uh, Cuckoo's Nest, uh, uh, Acom, and, and um, 
uh, Korea. And he really loved the shadows that Acom put in the, uh, on the show in Korea. But Acom's animation wasn't as zippy and cool as TMS animation or the animation from Cuckoo's Nest. And when Cuckoo's Nest sent us footage with, uh, with big, thick lines, you know, instead of the thin pencil lines that he wanted, we got some real sort of almost magic marker lines on the, the cuckoo's nest stuff. Steven sent me a note saying, Tom, this is unconscionable that you would allow this to happen. And I will take my name off the show if you don't get this fixed. So uh, the next day, Gene McCurdy and I are on an airplane to Taipei to explain to the folks at Cuckoo's Nest, you can't do the thick lines, you gotta do the thin lines. So, uh, and Stephen uh, ultimately uh, cooled off on that because we did get the thin lines. Um, he, uh, I, I remember I received a phone call uh, from him on the 405 and you'd think Steven Spielberg's got his own driver. Well, he didn't, he didn't have a driver. He was driving and he's, he's going down the 405 and clearly he is paging through a storyboard. He's like driving, but he's paging through a storyboard and he's on the phone, which I'm praying was uh, a speaker phone. And he's telling me, uh, okay, on panel four on uh, page 17, you know, I need a better shadow under the characters. And, and then suddenly says, oh, hi, Michelle. Michelle Lee just drove past uh, in the car next to me. So it's like he's doing, he's seeing celebrities. Yeah. He's a busy guy. Yeah. That's very, very cool. So thank you very much for coming out. And hopefully we'll get you back another time. We'll tell some more stories, but uh, we're hitting our time limit. Danny! <laughs> Danny! And with that, we've come to the end of the show, before the show, that will never start.